Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. You guys voted and today we are talking about Sherlock Holmes. So I actually have this volume, which is volume two. I believe that you know that this is the Barnes and Noble classics. They have a volume one, but I had a different collection that comprised more of the stories from early Sherlock Holmes. So I ended up purchasing this one. And the short story that I want to talk about today is the one that's called The Norwood Builder. Now this is actually the first mystery where the band's back together. So this is after the Moriarty affair. We had a little like mini episode where Sherlock gets back in contact with Watson. And now at the beginning of this story, Watson is back, moved back into 221B Baker Street. He sold his medical practice and he's ready to be Sherlock's assistant once more. One thing that I really enjoy about these later mysteries is that there's more of the development of the relationship between Sherlock and Watson. And I really like their development of, as characters and as friends. And I will say, I am just a big Sherlock fan. I'm not so much a Sherlock aficionado. I kind of gobble up anything that is Sherlock Holmes related. It doesn't have to be good just because I like it so much. So I would call myself a fangirl and I'm less discriminating when it comes to these stories. On one level, I recognize that perhaps they're not the height of literary execution, but I love them so much, I just gobble them up and I have such a fun time with them. I love that the introductions to these stories also allude to even more cases that are happening in between that we don't necessarily get to see. And I think it would be such a fun project to sort of outline the timeline of Watson and Sherlock and all the cases that they solve and then all of the extra canonical cases that are alluded to throughout the stories. Building a spreadsheet of Sherlock Holmes timeline would be fun, right? No, it actually would be really fun. Of course, as soon as Sherlock complains that there's no mysteries, Moriarty's been defeated, he's disappointed that he doesn't have anything to sort of sink his intellectual mind into, there's a ring and a frantic knock at the door. Another thing that's really classic about Sherlock Holmes as we see him in this story is that he does not know what people presume he should i.e. in this case, Mr. McFarlane comes and introduces himself and he acts like Sherlock should know who he is. And he does know what people presume he cannot. In this case, Sherlock Holmes quickly identifies that he's a bachelor, a solicitor, a Freemason, and asthmatic. It's fun to see now Watson's growth with respect to these, because Watson at the beginning of his relationship with Sherlock Holmes and in the early stories would have startled at surprise at Sherlock's acute perception about people. But now he's able to detangle Sherlock's line of reasoning and just put it into the narrative for us. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what Sherlock's logic is wor working at. A lot of times Sherlock describes his own logic as being deduction, but I would argue that it's actually much closer to induction. So for the example of Mr. Sherlock Holmes identifying that Mr. McFarlane is a bachelor, and in this case, the evidence for that is that he has untidiness of attire. Well, there's actually quite a few reasons why a person might have untidy attire, not least of which might be that they're rushing in to see Sherlock Holmes under a panic, as indicated by the way he rang the doorbell and the way he knocked on the door, right? But he's sort of saying the most likely outcome is that he's a bachelor and that's why his attire is untidy. So that's more of an example of induction rather than deduction. Now a lot of scholars have spent a lot of time actually writing about this question and I read one article in which they sort of talked about it was neither deduction nor induction but a new type of logic called abduction which is kind of a blend between the two and I just thought <laughs> That was kind of a funny article, mostly because abduction obviously is a word in English that means kidnapping, <laughs> which is a crime that Sherlock Holmes might solve. This case is a little bit different from the typical case because McFarlane is claiming that he will be wrongfully ac accused and Sherlock's effort is going to be actually to exonerate someone instead of honorate them. 
I don't know, accuse, accuse the right person, I guess. In my series on historical context for the Victorian era, I will link it up above, I talked about how true crime was really popular during the Victorian era, as it is today, and in particular the news article that is included in this story reminds me of this aspect of Victorian culture. It, the news article sort of talked about this scintillating case, this salacious case, you know, and so you can see it sort of blending news and entertainment there, and I, I think, well, true crime podcasts certainly do that in our own time. Sherlock begins by reasoning that the evidence as it is interpreted right now is too obvious, so that leads us down the line of, li of the idea that this could be a setup. Sherlock also observes that there are two mysteries going on. The first is, of course, who committed the murder or who committed the crime, and the second is why the old man, Mr. Oldacre, would make such a will sort of on a whim and out of the blue. And that's actually going to be the first mystery that he sets out to solve. And hearing Sherlock's account of the interview that he had with Mr. McFarlane's parents, it seems that there's a good motivation for Old Acre to frame the son and because of the contentious family history. At Norwood, Sherlock does discover that not all the property nor all the papers are accounted for, and this opens up the possibility that the organic remains on the woodpile, maybe they're not Old Acres. There is a theme of papers, wood, fire, even the name Norwood Estate ties into this. So now I want to actually talk a little bit about um, literary terms, literary terms of criticism, in particular metonymy. So metonymy and synecdoche are two literary terms that are easy to confuse with each other because they're under the umbrella of pars, por, <laughs> pars pro toto. And pars pro toto is Latin, it just stands for a part for the whole or a part sort of meaning that it represents the whole. In the case of metonymy, it's usually like a single aspect or a single attribute, which is referred to to then sort of refer to the whole thing. The White House, as an example, referring to the whole of the executive branch of the United States government. All hands on deck is a really good example of synecdoche because it's referring to a part of the body to represent the whole person. So I always remember synecdoche because it has the sound of the word neck and it's spelled different because it's probably a Greek root, it looks like, I don't know. Anyway, so we see that Sherlock Holmes sort of traces out the events in a metonymic way, in the way that he sort of like parses out the individual pieces and puts them into action. And he does this in a lot of his stories. We have the train trip evidence, which is actually the middle episode, and he's able to discern that from the way that the will was copied out. And that happens in the first interview scene at the beginning of the story. So he doesn't need to figure out that middle leg, but he rightly identifies that before there was the train trip, there was the events at Blackheath. So that's Old Acre coming and visiting Mr. McFarland to begin with and doing the will in the first place. That's the first mystery. And then there's the events at Norwood that need to be straightened out and figured out, which is Old Acre's home. And so in this way, he sort of metonymically tra traces out all of the steps. The final piece is actually the wax uh, thumbprint, which closes the case. And in that case, you might relate it more to synecdoche than to autonomy because it's actual physical evidence. And I think this type of literary device works really, really well in mystery stories like this because that's what evidence is. Evidence is pars pro toto, but in the real world, it's a small point piece that points to the whole. Also, we see that Oldacre, Oldacre's violence is seated earlier in the story with Mrs. the interview with Mr. McFarland's mother, who says that she once witnessed him releasing a cat into a bird cage so that the cat would kill all of the birds. And at the end, we see that Sherlock Holmes is intimating that the remains, the organic remains that were found on the fire were some form of animal, maybe bunnies or dogs or something like that. So I think one of the things that I really, really noticed this time, because it's been a while since I've read Sherlock and I just enjoyed it so much, is how neat and tidy his stories are. There is not a word out of place. There is not a word extra in these stories. They're quite short. They're quite brief, but boy, do they pack a punch. So 
That is what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion of Sherlock Holmes. As always, we will have the poll up on Monday once again, so you'll be able to vote on my Instagram stories. That will be up for 24 hours because of the nature of Instagram stories. But I will have the poll running Monday through Thursday on my Twitter account, and you can find me at a lovely jaunt on all my social media. So until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.